I'm more in, into digital technologies uh, for many, many years, and I've been specializing in, uh, in data and analytics and AI applications uh, for more than 25 years. Uh, my PhD is in this topic, and uh, the company that I've started 15 years ago, Agrino, is working exactly on this uh, topic. How can we combine data that is coming from lots of different sources, official sources that are out there, in different formats, in different types, in different languages, and how can we make sense out of this data? And to do so, we employ a lot of AI technologies, artificial intelligence technologies. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, what artificial intelligence is. And sometimes it sounds like black magic. Some crystal ball that is telling us about the future, but it is not black magic yet. So what is artificial intelligence? Uh, they teach it uh, next door. It's a branch of computer science. It's something that I've been taught when I went to school, uh, to university, uh, and it's a, it's a computing uh, branch of computer science that is trying to imitate in some way the way that we express some intellectual behaviors. So this is the definition. How can we develop capabilities in machines that in a sense imitate what we do as an intellectual process. And this means very, very practical things. Can we imitate the way that we look into information so that we discover something that is meaningful? Can we get lots of observations and put them together so that we can generalize from those observations and arrive to a conclusion? that is valid? Can we use past experience, like in cyclic events that uh, Alec was describing, so that we can predict that something will come up because the conditions are similar? This is what this branch of computer science is doing. And there is a test that everyone can apply, and we will apply this today. There is a test that we can use uh, to see if a machine is intelligent. It was devised a couple of hours from here in, at the University of Manchester by the father of uh, computing, Alan Turing. He said, if we put in a room a human being, and we put in another room a machine, a computer, and we ask something without knowing who is answering to us, the machine, the computer, or the human being, and we cannot tell from the answer who is replying to us, then yes, the machine is most probably intelligent. And today we can do the test. Eh? So 73 years later, we can do this test and see how it works. I will show you how. I have a, a, a computer and a human hidden in two different rooms, and we will run it together, you, I promise. Let's do it. So we will ask a question. I will not promote a particular uh, technology, but I'm going to use it. <laughs> so either we have Catherine replying to us, or a machine, and we will ask something that will make my presentation easier. How does AI Innovate food safety management. As simple as that. Are you taking notes? <laughs> <laughs> so this is the answer that we get. Is this a machine or a human? Replying to us. What do you think? Okay. So it's an intelligent one because it answers like a human, but not there yet. Alan Turing would be very, very proud of this demonstration, eh? because it's exactly what he was thinking about when he published this paper uh, in the 50s. I want to focus uh, on one of these cases, uh, the part that has to do with early 
contamination detection in the way that uh, we call it we, we call it food risk intelligence and in our work this is the, the area where we work in our company uh, looking into all the different signals all the information that's out there uh, that can help us identify a risk uh, and ideally before it actually hits us uh, and it takes a process that if you ask people to do it it will take lots of people that have to work for many many hours or days eh? monitoring as many sources as possible and trying to understand if there is something there that should lead us to an action to a decision and this is something that uh, the people that we work with the customers that we work with, they, they use it, they employ it to answer questions on a daily basis in different teams. So we have people that are trying to understand if there is an alert out there that is relevant to my supply chain. Does it affect one of our products, one of our suppliers? <coughs> have I seen this alert before? Is this something that I have managed already? Or it's a new one, so we have to do something? Everything that has to do with the questions uh, related to incident monitoring, I would call it. Then linking this back to ingredient risk assessment or supplier risk assessment. How can we automate and support these decisions? How can we rank the ingredients, the critical ingredients that we have and see which are the ones that are, uh, we should be closely taking an eye on? Because this is a period where they are affected by potential contamination. Or how can we score and rank our suppliers or our facilities? Because right now something is happening or might happen that we need to be uh, carefully looking at. It can also support decisions that are a little bit uh, longer term, like where do we invest uh, our testing money, our testing budget this year? Which are the risk priorities? Uh, that we should be looking at, what is happening out there, or where should we invest our audit uh, budget. These are the different types of decisions uh, that are, are other, under the umbrella of risk intelligence. And uh, there is an analogy of how we can answer and we can provide support to these uh, decisions. And my, my favorite analogy is weather forecasting. If we go back 20 years, I still remember waiting every uh, afternoon, every evening for the news, for someone to close the, uh, the news telling us about the weather forecast uh, for the next day or for the next uh, week. This was not a magician, not an oracle of some kind. It's someone that was based on science with very complex mathematical and statistical models working for them giving us a forecast of uh, what will probably happen during the next uh, days. Today, it's uh, at our fingertips. We can use different applications. The power of these models is available for us to use on a daily basis. So this is where we are arriving today. Moving away from relying upon the expertise of scientists who have to come and tell us what will happen, and bringing this power uh, at our fingertips. Again, with lots of science behind them, the automation part and the easiness in accessing these uh, capabilities, what is changing. And what is interesting is that this is not a single decision that is supported by one system that is ruling them all and has all the knowledge that we are expecting. No, we shouldn't expect a chat GPT uh, Oracle to be answering to all our questions. We are talking about lots of different models depending on what kind of ingredient we are looking or what kind of hazard we are looking. We have to build different forecasting models uh, behind. And they have to come in different platforms and environments that we are using on a daily basis to support this decision. So this is rather a, a quite complex ecosystem of uh, AI models powering uh, software applications. 
if there is one thing that I would like us to have uh, with this technology, digital technology at hand, is uh, this one. To have models that we can trust, and trust means that we understand how they calculate the likelihood of an emergency risk. We can understand how accurate these predictions are, and we feel comfortable with this accuracy of the particular model. One of the colleagues that were uh, having a conversation about accuracy uh, a couple of weeks ago was telling me that Nikos, even 40% of accuracy in such a model will make, will make my life easier than having no forecast at all. I know that it's a 40% uh, accuracy that I'm getting, so I will decide how much I will trust the model, but at least I know how much this is. And eventually, I think that this is something that will be inside the different systems and applications that all the different functions in an organization uh, are using, ranging from product R&D in a product life cycle management software, then when they're taking decisions about which ingredients they will be adding in a recipe and having an indication of whether an ingredient is riskier versus to another ingredient and they want to see it on the fly. So they, they don't need to call someone from uh, food safety and say, okay, I'm considering of using this or that. So how can we put it inside their workflows and decisions? Or procurement, when they're selecting or considering changing suppliers, they know if we have uh, suppliers with a potentially higher risk profile uh, in terms of safety, and other, other parts of the organization where we can feed this risk likelihood information. You can see these things in action. Uh, we are having a workshop uh, a, a little bit later where we will be using our platform for the guy to demonstrate two examples of such predictive analytic dashboards. And you're welcome to come look at these two dashboards uh, on incident prediction and hazard prediction and help us get fit your feedback and ideas on how uh, you see value in those and what else you would be expecting. So, it would be great to see you also at the workshop. Thank you. Thank you.